So, thinking in the shower in the, in this morning, the birthplace of all proper philosophy, um, I was thinking about the difference between what I'm going to, well, what is mostly called, uh, you know, old school D&D and new school. Like some of the, I'm not going to go into everything, but some of the main differences are like how characters become stronger and how characters advance. To my understanding, and I am a filthy 5e only new player, blah, 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 whatever, majority if you want to use um, to my understanding, in older editions, when your character leveled up, basically all they ever got was more health or more spells, or and or more spells, depending on whether you were also a spellcaster. But that was basically it. All leveling up did was give you, like, four extra health points if you had really high constitution. If you didn't have high constitution, you might get, like, one if you were lucky, and you were thankful, <laughs> but mostly the way your characters would get stronger, particularly if you were like a fighter, or to use old school vernacular, fighting man, if you were an old, if you were an old school martial character, then the only way for you to become a more effective character outside of more health is items, magic items, magic sword, magic armor. A ring that lets you fly by farting or something, you know, whatever. <laughs> whatever it is, give you new ability. That's the only way to get new abilities through magic items. Whereas in modern DD, 5e, there are, you can still get stronger by or gain new abilities through items, and there's a lot of differing abilities and combinations of things that you can only achieve with various items. But your characters do, in fact, advance in ability and strength purely through level. There is a difference between a level 2 character in 5e and a level 10 character. That level 10 character, in addition to having more health, just like the old school D&D character would have, the 5e character at level 10 would have multiple attacks would have all sorts of extra features that let them do something specific. And the difference between these two types of things are, I guess, like the intrinsic property or the, in, the intrinsic abilities of the character, something that comes from the character, like class features and racial features and ship and feats and stuff like that, or extrinsic uh, abilities, things that come from, like, magic items. And when it's all down on the page, it's all just your character anyway, and when you're actually playing, it ends up being the same thing. But I feel like there are differing mindsets or philosophies that go into that, and I've already, um, now that I've joined a game DM'd by someone who is familiar with old school D&D and to my understanding comes from or started playing older, much older editions of the game. To my understanding, anyone that comes from that, from those older games, they use, they view magic items as the main way to advance. And this particular DM is very liberal with magic items. Like we killed a hag and we got a bag of holding um, an amulet of the devout, which is a special, um, special item for, uh, clerics that increases their spell save DC and stuff. Uh, we got a little item that was the equivalent of a flame tongue long sword and we're level four. So, and I think we got something else, but I don't remember. What, oh, a, a blood well vial. The, that's you know, the equivalent, the same as, as the amulet of the devout for the for sorcerers. But we're level four, and the, some of these are rare magic items, like the equivalent are rare. Well, the amulet and the bloodwell vial, I think, are uncommon, but the, fl the flame tongue longsword equivalent is a rare magic item. So this DM's just throwing stuff at us. 
And there's always things you can do there, like, okay, if you throw more magic items at the party, then, well, um, they are able to handle more dangerous encounters. Great. You can use more dangerous monsters. Whereas the one of the other DMs I play with, and I'm definitely more in line with this method of thinking, um, there's a lot of room for intrinsic stuff, like special feats for designed specifically for a character to use. Um, I don't really have any examples, but I've talked. We've talked about um, my character dating a EI Jutsu like katana quick draw style thing, and coming up with some mechanics for that. Is the proper term EI Jutsu? Because Jutsu is just style. Um, it's not some sort of magic bullshit. Um, but the ideal quick draw style bullshit. Um, but, and I definitely lean more towards that. I am totally willing to homebrew a fee or give your character the ability to do something really specific. And this also comes into this, there are some design considerations for that. Like, in an environment where you can homebrew, whether it's a feat or an item, either one, but if you can homebrew it for one specific character in mind, you don't have to worry about balance as much. Like, for example, in Site 27, most of the characters are spellcasters of some kind. Only one of the character, or one of the characters is a rogue. And one of them is a rogue, one is a let me just go through. We've got a rogue arcane trickster, an artificer, a cleric, a bard, and now a ranger. And originally, I didn't have that ranger player, but I designed all these guns with most of these characters only having, or all of these characters only having one attack per round in mind. Like, the cleric, I made a little submachine gun thing. It's got a little shorter ammo, but it fires and it uh, can fire multiple rounds per attack. And I've tweaked the numbers on that here and there, but um, that'll do like a pretty respectable damage per round. Like I think right now it does like three d four. No, it does a d four plus ability mod three times per sh per attack. That's pretty strong. But the cleric only has one attack, and. These guns are limited by ammo, and ammo is important. It's, probably, it's not important in this mission, but in future missions, it will probably end up being important. For that character, it lets them do like reasonable damage. Uh, I think the average damage there is they've got a. I think they have a plus four or a plus three to their ability mod. Let's just assume plus four. So, 2.5 times three, 7.5. Plus 12. So 19.5 average damage when you attack with that. That's pretty strong. But they can, again, they only one attack per round and that lets them be competitive. However, if you were to give that to like a fighter, who at this point in the game would have two attacks and action surge, then they'd be doing effectively resourceless damage of, of 40 damage with just two attacks. Easy possibly more because they might have a higher ability mod. That would be a consideration. And I would also, I probably wouldn't let them have that gun. I would give them a better gun that's maybe, that's probably slightly less damage per shot or per attack, but has better properties for sustained damage or something. You know, like an assault rifle that can do something. But the point is, if, if I'm designing a gun, a weapon for a single character, it's easier to design. You don't have to worry about as many limitations. Whereas if you're just designing a weapon, just kind of in general, like an item or a feat in general, that anybody could take, that is much trickier. Because, like, let's say I were to 
turn all these items and this adventure into like a module and publish it. I couldn't publish the submachine gun as it is directly. I would have to put some kind of limiter on it, like the first attack you make per round, it attacks that way. And then every subsequent attack is just another D4 plus ability mod, which works well enough and I think is not enough of a disincentive for characters that do have extra attacks. So you can work around it, but it's the fact that you do have to work around it and you have to make those considerations. And if you don't make these considerations, then players will quickly break whatever it is you made. Uh, I remember I read an example of, and this is also items that a uh, items that a enemy might have. Like I remember I read some story about a DM that homebrewed this like wizard guy, wizard or spellcaster or whatever that had uh, glasses of uh, fogs, you could see through fog with these glasses, and it was this fun boss encounter where this this uh, wizard was like moving around it, and cast fog cloud, and was moving around in it, and the players have to track him down each each round and find him and attack him, and it was, that sounds like a cool encounter. The problem with making it an item, instead of something intrinsic to that wizard, to that boss, is after they kill the boss, they can get that item. And now they can see through fog. And now you have to design all your subsequent encounters around your PC's ability to just see through fog with no effort. Like if they take, which, how is that different than like a ranger taking the fog cloud spell and the blind fighting fighting style? Well, there's some opportunity cost in the fighting style choice, and that only works within 10 feet, blah, blah, blah. But items, I feel like it's easier to get away from in some cases. But, yeah, sometimes, um, yeah, again, it's easier to design things for a single character in mind. Like, again, for Site 27, that ranger joined the group, and he, him being a martial character breaks a little bit of the encounter design I have. I designed the normal monsters to have about 30 health, and that is just over the original four characters, the, the rogue, the artificer, the bard, and the cleric. That is just over they, their resourceless average damage. So if they're just taking the attack action with their weapons, even if they're using the armor piercing rounds that let them bypass these enemies' uh, resistance, it they would not a single character would not be able to kill a single one of these enemies in one round without either spending resources or attacking or uh, rolling extremely high we're getting a crit so yeah, they either have to team up or they have to spend resources and both teaming up to to take down a single target well there's more tar there's like eight of them so if all four of them team up they could take down two maybe three of these enemies of these of these monsters well, that's still six of them left. Some of them are going to get up, and they're going to be able to get up on them, and they're going to be able to take attacks. Remember, HP is a resource, too. But then, after I added this ranger, and I let him, he took some feats, I did homebrew some items for him, and he ended up going with two weapon fighting with spears. And, again, I, uh, also I homebrewed two weapon fighting a little bit, so that it mostly works the way it's written. But it, the offhand attack doesn't take your bonus action. It's just part of your attack action. So the damage is the same, but you don't have to spend your bonus action. I feel like that keeps it more or less in line. It's still weaker than Sharpshooter or Great Weapon Master, but, eh. but it also is differentiated from Polearm Master and Crossbow Expert via simply... 
via simply, what do you call it? Um, you, the fact that you don't have to use your bonus action. But then he also took a feat that gave him like a homebrew spear dancer feat that was really weird. It was kind of cool. It gives him some bonus action stuff that he can do if he's using spears. And it also gives him plus one to spears, to attack rolls. And because he, he invested in a spear-specific feat, I also let him uh, treat these spears as light so that he can, uh, he can dual wield them. As long as he has some kind of investment, I let that happen. But it's only for spears. If he were to try to dual wield something else, he would suffer normal restrictions. But that character is a Horizon Walker Ranger. And his resourceless average damage is about 33 if all three attacks hit. Because he can go, he can use Planar Warrior, increase his damage by a d8, and then three attacks, which totals up, uh, which is a uh, Spear Dancer also increases a Spear's damage die from a d6 to a d8. That's another thing. Um, so his average damage is 4.5 plus, plus I think 5 per attack, times 3 for 28.5, plus another 4.5 equaling 33, right? Yeah, that's right. Equaling 33. That character can take one of these monsters down with resourceless damage if all three attacks hit and he rolls average. At least. Um, and he doesn't exactly break it, but it lets him, that character, have lean into the fantasy of being a close range character. He's more combat oriented, let's say, than the rest of the characters. So he can take one of these things down himself. But the thing is, this is all a melee range where these monsters want to be anyway, and there's a lot, and there's a large number of them. So if he's going to get up into the front lines, he's basically there himself. He might take one of these down, but then three more are immediately going to swarm him. So that lets the rest of the party soften up the monsters around him, and then maybe he can work with them to take more of them down, or however they want to go about it. But this, that's, that also affects your encounter design. Um, so I didn't have to modify it because of this. It just let them tackle it in a certain way. But let's take, let's take another hypothetical encounter uh, where there's like a necromancer and he's got like six beefy zombies. They're not just normal zombies. Uh, I don't remember what the exact difference of zombies, ghouls, and ghasts, what all that bullshit is. But let's say they're they're considerably beefier than normal zombies. They've got like 20 health, and they do a bit more damage. Or they've got, let's just say, more health. Enough that um, the players, again, wouldn't be able to take them down. A single player wouldn't be able to take one down resourceless. So, depending on what your goals are, you can have that monster act a little different, that encounter act a little different. Like, if, let's say against two different parties. The first party is really tactically oriented, uh, really, they understand the action economy really well. They also do a lot of bullshit, I'm going to say, like conjure animals or uh, animate objects where they can get a dumb amount of extra attacks per round by virtue of all these extra things they summon and just do shit tons of damage. Well, in a case like that, I might design a, uh, a trait for the necromancer that, say, every time Whenever the Necromancer takes damage, he can choose to not take that damage at all and instead spread that damage out among his minions so that um, 
even if they were going to try to do a stupid amount of extra of attacks and try to kill the necromancer before he can do anything he still effectively has the same HP pool as or is using all these minions as extra health essentially as a shield so they have to take all these minions down first before they can effectively take down the necromancer something like that or a similar effect that effectively accomplishes the same thing if the necromancer dies or once he reaches HP uh, zero health he can like devour as many of his minions as he wants and regain like take kill them and then he can gain their combined HP or he can uh, recover HP equal to their combined HP so it's effectively the same thing but just two different ways to go about it so that allows those that first like highly coordinated optimized party that's using these extremely powerful spells that allows that party to do what they want to do but they still it allows the encounters to still play out normally instead of them just insta killing the necromancer and then cleaning up a bunch of direction with zombies afterwards Whereas for the second party, let's say, their characters are good, their characters are strong, but they're not particularly optimized, like, there's no um, Hexblade Warlock Sorcerer, or uh, Hexblade Warlock uh, Paladin Multi-classy classes, there's no uh, Sharpshooter Crossbow Expert Fighters, um, there's no Druids Double, like, casting uh, conjure animals and animate objects, like I said. There's none of that. They're strong, but they're not optimized and they're not min-maxed. And they're not super tactically minded. They, instead of all ganging up on one target to take it out as quickly as possible and eliminate its action economy, they all just break out and kind of take their own monster and have their own little 1v1s instead of working as a group. So let's say they all do that. You probably don't need that mechanic anymore, where the Necromancer is able to either spread damage out or devour his minions, but then if, if still they manage to kill the Necromancer first, maybe he can do that, but maybe he can only do it once, instead of just whenever he reaches zero. Maybe it just happens once, he devours all of his minions at once, and he goes back to full health, and in that way you can reward the players for just doing a cool thing and maybe learning that going after the Necromancer might be the best best case, because he's controlling all these minions, so by attacking him, they can eliminate the whole group if they can kill him fast enough. But, you know, that's just that's some nuance to counter design for different parties and different groups. Um, this video went kind of all over the place, but deal with it. Um, yeah, but that's like for two different groups. Uh, yeah, I guess that's all I have to say for today. For, for, for this video, I might record another one right here.